discussing the news and making sense of a nation on the go. You're listening to The Long Form with Sunny Nyombia. This podcast is brought to you by The New Times. Hello, everyone. Today, not only are over 60% of all members of parliament women, a world-leading statistic, they are also the heads of government departments and leading financial institutions, never mind being able to own land and open bank accounts. The gains that have been made by women coming from where we've come or they've come are undisputed. But listening to the conversations that Rwandans have, both on and offline, it seems that there needs to be further steps to ensure gender equality, especially when it comes to certain aspects of Rwandan culture and in the new context of new definitions of sex and gender. To discuss this topic, I'm joined by two guests, well-known feminist and activist Sylvie Nsanga and Glory Iribajiza, the New Times Gender and Innovation Editor. Now, if you want to react to this conversation, use the hashtag longform RW on Twitter and share your thoughts. But before we continue, do you know what you need to do today? You need to join the over 40,000 daily subscribers of the New Times e-paper to enjoy credible, in-depth reporting on Rwanda. Visit the website newtimes.co.rw to register for free. And now, back to the show. Greetings, ladies. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Hi, Sunny. Hello, thank you for having us. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I think today's topic is uh, very timely, especially in the fact that a couple of months from now, we're having a major international conference on women. The women deliver. Yes. Are you going to be a part of it? Oh, of course. And Glory? Of course. <laughs> okay. So uh, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'd like to ask all of you the same question because obviously, Sylvie, you probably come from a generation a bit closer to mine. And then we have the much younger but not unwise Glory in this conversation. So I would like to kind of hear what both of you think about the same question. The question is this. Can you both be a feminist and also have a Gusawa ceremony? And what I mean is this. Do you think that you are betraying your gender as women if your family receives cows for you. I will start with Sylvie. Thank you very much. That is really very interesting. Since I was young, I've been really advocating for removing the dowry part. I know it's a very important step, uh, mm. especially in our culture and um, in marriage. I thought it could be really betraying. <laughs> so I, I refused the dowry. Oh, uh, really? Yes. How did your family take it? They were very, very offended because I come from a very good and conservative family where uh, they really believe in culture. They really respect every step of the wedding, if I can say that. Like in my family, they don't even hire someone to come to give those speeches, you know, the mm. negotiation around that. Mm. Even the MC, it's like everyone has to have his place or her place in the ceremony. First, I knew long ago that I would not accept it because of some member of my families. I had a cousin uh, who was in the refugee camp, the Congolese refugee camp here in Rwanda, who lost her long, long time fiance because he didn't have a dowry. I kept asking him, when are we coming for the wedding? And finally, he told me that he's not going to wed soon because he doesn't have a fiancé. And then I said, what happened to your beautiful fiancé? He said, uh, she married another person. I was so shocked that I tried to ask the background of the husband of the ex. Uh, I found that it doesn't mean he was really wealthy it's because the guy could afford the dowry. And it really questioned everything around culture for me. Me, I just said, how can a girl expect a boy in a refugee camp to have a car when they are not earning even a dollar per day or per week or per month? They are just being fed. It really kept in me. I questioned everything around me. And then I said, why you didn't tell us so that we contribute and we give you the dowry? So with all the pride, he kept quiet. I was a youth leader 18 years ago. I was the secretary general of the Rwanda National Youth Council. I had a privilege to tour Rwanda in different uh, districts. And curiously, in Rwanda ourselves, we have different belief and culture, even though we may think we have one culture. When you arrive in Kyangugu, you will find that for a woman to remain with her fiancé, will have to cook a full chicken, which has to be eaten by the fiancé. 
The whole chicken. The whole chicken by himself. And if you don't have it, you may not get that boy. If you are in Bugesera, a girl is obliged to go with a mattress and a bike. Understanding that Bugesera, it was hard to have water in the past. So a woman was supposed to come with a mattress and a bike. So I asked myself, are those things considered really valuable assets when people are coming together? I came to realize that what the woman bring on the table is not valued. So as a young activist by then, I really questioned it. I started talking to our ministers by then, and we are helping young people. We are empowering them. We are giving, putting them into cooperatives. But there is something we are not doing. Because marriage, personally, as a Christian and as a Rwandan, I believe in it. But not far from Kigali by then, I don't remember how that province was called. Is it Byumba? Very, very close. One time I heard on the radio, a priest who was explaining problem in his community and one of the problem was girls more or less the same as in Kyangugu. It really questioned everything I had. Uh, I said, why are different people I respect in our culture not bringing this on table? I just said, God help me to not really receive the dowry. Myself, I was educated. I can even have that amount of money and give it to my fiancé. He comes, he pays for it. But I said, for my peace, I'm going to do it. I wasn't inspired by women. Mm. It was the hardship men goes through, poor mm. men, mm. to get the cost of the dowry. Mm. I even questioned some banks. If I can get a loan for a car, if I can get a loan for a house, why I can't get now a loan as a man for, for the car to, mm. to go to marry the woman I want? So I said, I'm really doing it for men. By then, my fiancé, and for him, him, I was lucky himself, he believes in human rights, and he said, I don't have any problem. So I thought that was simple as that. But the struggle I went through to convince my family, oh my God, it was just, the wedding was almost stopping. My uncle said, this cannot happen. So good or bad enough, my father was the oldest in the family because my family is like a whole country administration. They have a chef of Mdugudu. My father was kind of a president of the family because of his age. And he was the one to give a final say on anything which could change in the culture. So I had to discuss first with my uncles in Kigali who said, you know, we don't have the power to change that. So my father told me that because I'm your father and if I change, people will think it's because you are my daughter. And then I said, Papa, maybe it's it's the right time because I'm your daughter and I have that privilege of having you as the last person to make a final word to change this. Good enough, he didn't really have choice because I said, I'm getting married and there is no dowry. But one last thing I forgot, I love car cows and I know my family loves it. I questioned my uncles. I told them I know because there is one uncle of mine who was keeping my uncle's cows in North Kivu, you know. They have been killing people for a really long time. So I got married nine years ago. And like two years before that, one of them was killed and he was taking care of the cows of my uncles. I even questioned them. I told them, because you, you are educated. You leave your brother who's not educated to take care of your cows. You see now he was killed. And by then I just questioned the value of a cow in our culture. If people don't want to move on and understanding that at the point of even sacrificing one uncle in a, in a secure place, keeping your cows, I just said, okay, cows in the past were given because people were living in communities with big spaces where they can keep them. Now in the city, people don't have where to keep those cows. The meaning was that when your family could see the cow, could even drink milk from that cow, and even though you are far, but they feel you are closer because of the cow they are seeing. I told my mom, you don't have where to put this cow. Where are you going to put it? They are going to give you money. So the whole me, they are going to give you an envelope of money just to buy me or do what? So my parents didn't have much choice to refuse me, but they stood bold. They said the wedding should continue. I want to ask you just a question because I'm also married and my family gave cows to the family of my, of my wife. So I did not have a problem getting the cows, unlike your uh, friend. And on the other side, my father-in-law also has a farm. We had somewhere to put the cows that would be given to him. In cases where both sides, there's not a problem, would there be a problem? Normally, I would not have a problem, but remember that I have privilege. Coming from an educated family, from a family which could afford anything I wanted, I needed really to give away my privileges so that 
other people will not be stopped because they don't have that. Because I said maybe a woman who will hear that Sylvie, um, they did not give a diary and she had she had it, will not insist to request to his boyfriend or his fiancée. Mm. I just believe that human rights are things which should relate to all of us. And giving away your privileges, it's one way in being in solidarity with those people who are in need. And mm. that was the whole concept for me. Mm. Of course, refusing people to give money in an envelope because I said that this is again culture also. If culture is about that cow and people give money in an envelope at the end of the day and then the bargaining around because remember people from the other side comes like a week or two weeks before they bargain. Literally is bargaining. I know in some places where they say one cow, other people say four. Me, I'm lucky in, in my family being rich or poor, it will always be one cow. Mm. So they will not say oh my, my daughter has now a PhD it's five cows because there are places where those bargaining happens. For me, I needed to feel the pain of those who don't, cannot afford it, but also showing them that it's not an important step. The most important thing is you loving the person you're going to stay with. Very interesting answer. Glory, do you have any thoughts? Thank you, Sunny. I think, yes, you can be a feminist and, and get Dory on your wedding but I still think it's it's a betrayal because as much as we sugarcoat Dory in modern age it is still men in your family bargaining your worth it is still a man trying uh, like Sylvie said it's still a man toiling to make sure that he makes the money this time it's money they're like we'll value one cow for 500k for example it is still that it's it's still the family of your man or your man as well asking your family as if you don't have rights or anything to go in their family actually go in their family and leave your family while he does not leave his family on the condition that they give them the cows or the money and why i think it's betrayal just like sylvie said however much you think it's a subtle gesture it's for the culture young girls don't have where to look up to they still remember that in your wedding, men were like, uh, we don't have that girl, we have an old woman and a baby. People literally begged for you to go into their family. They still don't think that your family counts after that because now you have left your family, which has raised you, whose blood that you have, you carry, and you're going into this other foreign family. And you will hear women being sung in, in songs like Why? You're not leaving your parents. Just because you've given me a few cows does not mean uh, I'm leaving them. And um, we have to also admit that the dory is also the source of power dynamics. You think so? It, yeah. I, I'll explain why. Actually, not just dory. The event Gusaba no Gukwa. It means we're asking for a girl who does not even consent. I've seen in some cultures, a woman is given a microphone and they're like, do you consent to going with this man to be your husband? If I may, while you're able to finish that thought, what happens because right now, the vast majority of people that I know, at least the city people, usually we date for five, six years or even maybe one year and the families know each other already you've already bought a ring she has tried on the ring so in those cases would there still be issues of consent or do you have other cases like i said that is the sugar coating because the actual ceremony that is recorded on video that youngers who have attended the wedding will see is people discussing about you while you're not there and then finally, when uh, the head of the family gives you away, that's when you come in and that's when you're handed over to the other family. Mm. So at this point, we did not see you consent or although I agree that somehow you may have consented, but why should it still look like I don't have a say in this? I don't know if you even know that some women don't get to speak on their weddings, right? Mm. Because, uh, well, they're brides. And what I was saying is that Dory could be the source of power dynamics because, first of all, people are bargaining. A woman's value, a bride's value, is sometimes measured by how much money the family of the husband has given in exchange for the girl. For example, if my family was given the dowry of 500,000 and a woman whose family received dowry of 6 million, of course, we're not even close. 
our value is totally different. And like Sylvie said, sometimes it depends on your education, the family that you come from, but I don't see how this should matter. Even the man who can afford the most dory is the most respected. Do you know uh, Kanaka gave two million in dory? Hmm. He's rich. He gave the family dignity. Mm. He has power. They're strong people. And um, uh, we've had cases especially in rural areas where women are being abused by their husbands and the, the thing they tell them is that we pay dory. Especially when it comes to marital rep. You have to have sex with me because I paid for that. Things like that that men tell women. And let's not even go to GBV. Let's talk about normal, typical, random power dynamics in a family. A husband... Lord of the family. The woman, umufasha, a helper, or umutima urugu, right? And although we think these are just words that people use, although we think that even rural women or urban women are living through different experiences, but research shows otherwise. For example, in unpaid care work, if you have been to a regular market like Nyabugogo, how many men will you see looking for tomatoes or... Irish potatoes, things like that. But how many women will, will you see there, right? If you go to a vaccination site where children are receiving their vaccination, how many men will you see there? Because this kind of power dynamics that already starts the moment when your dory is paid, it will impact you throughout your life because you will always be the woman who has received to I, play a certain role in someone's family. I'll send this question to Sylvie. So I'm hearing what she's saying. And the question that I would really want to ask is, those are challenges that women face, right? Whether it is unpaid labor, uh, GBV, but does that have anything to do whatsoever with our traditional practices? Are we not able to separate them and enjoy the ceremony, the cattle giving between families, the gifting, and then also separate it from the effects of bad gender relations? Or does one create the other? I think I wouldn't separate them mm. because we live in a patriarchal setting where society not shape even rules a society believe in and you will see that men and women from early ages were expected to do different things where gender roles come and you cannot really especially in African setup dissociate the value of a woman in our society without seeing really seeing back in her culture not even a woman all of us men and women we are expected to behave in a certain way different ways because you are a man because you are a woman and that follows us even in our studies it follows us even in our offices where you will see when there is an issue at work or even a party where there is a social event women are expected to do the social work around that when if there is a sick person in your office you will see that people will say why those women are not even thinking about something so what we do maybe as feminists is to identify those social barriers which affect women, not only women, which really push for inequalities because remember patriarchy itself we call it an unfair system because it define it gives that power a man to lead to choose to select to bless the family and even to set up guidelines you will see really the standards different societies in our way surrounding they were shaped by men and they were shaped in an unfair way because you will see from a younger age uh, especially like in the north of Africa, you will see uh, where they are marrying young girls. I know their practices and everything around that. Everything is centered around pleasing men. Mm -hmm. And that pushes us in understanding that why feminism even is centering itself around women. It's because we very much know from our past that women are the one facing those um, inequality. And if you see the definition itself of gender is really making sure that uh, men and women are enjoying the same rights, the same opportunities. The tendency, of course, people are challenging us. Gender equality is not women's rights. It's about men and women. But when you are going to address an issue of inequality, you identify the inequalities and you see who are the victim of these inequalities. And majority of them, you find it's women. We have to obey to certain rules established by a society. And that society was really led by men from the beginning. Of course, we have now laws which are trying to disrupt 
on the topic of societies and how they operate, I want to ask you a question. Obviously, it seems that both of you are not great fans of dowry for different reasons, but they seem quite similar. Can you give me examples of other cultural practices that are inherently Rwandan that you deem harmful for women? Number two, can you actually give me any traditional Rwandan practice that feminists are comfortable with? Because it seems that it's very easy for us to look at our culture and some of the, the practices of our past and say they're problematic. But is there anything that is good? Before we continue this very interesting conversation, are you looking for a job or is there a tender you want to bid for? On the New Times Job Mart, you will find hundreds of jobs and tender listings. Visit the Job Mart today by going to its website, jobs.newtimes.co.rw. If you want to post a job opportunity, call 7 9489 and ask about the great rates. And now back to the show. Of course, there are many negative practices in our culture. For example, the labia elongation. What's it called in Kinyaranda? Gukuna, Gucha Imyeyo. I think it has different name, but okay. I grew up in uh, Rwandan culture, though I didn't grow up uh, in Rwanda, but it was really a Rwandan culture where from the young age, actually, my activism sometimes is based on what I lived or what I saw, I heard, because I was part of a community. I remember at a very young age, seven, eight, being told fast by people who weren't from my community. It's really stayed in my head, Sunny. I remember one of my girlfriend, very, very young, telling me that they don't shower hot water. Their mom told them they should not shower hot water. And because I was really questioning many times things around us, and I remember that time her telling me that if you shower hot water, you will not have a husband. So we were very young. We couldn't really decode that. Then I kept asking, it seems from her understanding that hot water brings a lot of discharge from the vagina and it makes you uh, how can I say <laughs> maybe in Kinyarwanda it's a common non kuzana mazi things like that so mm. it was from another Congolese culture and in my setup and my culture it was that you have to elongate your labia because if you don't elongate your labia you will not have a husband your husband will not enjoy I really remember those things and that's at seven years seven of eight. Eight, eight years because I was in grade one grade two and those were the conversation you weren't told them directly from your mom but it was either from grown-up cousins or aunties around so imagine at that age as a child where they were stealing our childhood definitely there are things we were supposed to be hearing at that time as young kids to encourage us to study to do physical things to do sport S some things really which is not that as young as that, girls are being told they are being prepared for marriage. Being prepared for marriage, you are being prepared. Sexuality is coming to you in an unorganized way, not in an age appropriate. And you find that I'm not a researcher. I will be very happy to see researchers venturing in this, like a relation between those practices, Gukuna, and teen pregnancy. And because uh, I'm seeing people saying these days, young girls are sexual active. Imagine it's other people who touch you in the vagina to pull the labia. Already by a definition of rape, for me, you are raping me if you are touching my vagina when I'm a kid because you know a child does not consent. If aunties and friends to your mamas start pulling because they told us that when they do it when we are young, it's easy. Mm. They didn't even give us a choice that you can do it in the near future. They chose you that you don't have other choices. Those are silent conversations happening in the background, not outside in the public. And we socialize with them. We grow with them. And that is to satisfy the main ego, the main pleasure. When we start speaking about that, of course, we, ha we are labeled as just complicated women but sometimes we are giving real experiences of course today we are not even seeing policymakers pointing out on some of those practices like mm -hmm. labia elongation and if you see the world health organization in the past research are showing that it was on the list of, of uh, fgm the fourth type of, of genital mutilation but later the movement of, of women who went and advocated and said the pleasure is shared when a woman is pulling also she's um, enjoying when 
the water is coming a lot she's also enjoying sex but understanding that sunny who who told those people that mia will marry a rwandan man first who will like those things recently i traveled somewhere and i met a, i think i tweeted about it i met a rwandan girl who had really pulled her halabia and now she had to do the reverse mm. reverse is what to cut them because they can't go back and she did it in an unprofessional way i think and it brought a tumor and things like that it was so heartbreaking so brief we are being initiated to unfair practices just to please men and who is doing that it's again women because people are challenging us and saying but who tells you to do that it's women who are initiating you to that yes it's women who are initiating but any mother wants what is best for her daughter because you know the culture you are in is so unfair men loves that you are going to do your best to initiate your daughters to that and um health wise is not even hygienic because the people uh, who are doing that maybe they, they, they are not clean maybe they may have other disease they can transmit to the children and you see yes we are really promoting girls they are going to school we are seeing women participating in politics they are participating in private sector everywhere but there are something we don't want to tackle the social norms which really are affecting us there is unpaid care work i it's also linked to our culture where we are the women who are supposed to care for everyone for the sick people all those different things i think that uh, there are so many uh, practices there are so many things the belief that men want a woman who is slim i don't know about that one though depending on where people are growing up now you are seeing people defining a woman they want i understand it's easy to shape a girl to be obedient to do abcd but it's hard to reduce my size but are those traditional issues or is it just part of i guess modern society it's really traditional but mm. it's being carried uh, even in the current mm. uh, society of course there are also positive uh, personally i believe in the respect for elder this mm. is something i know has been for generation elderly people in our culture they had an important role to advise people to listen to them but also like when i was young i used to see people in the bus stand when they see an elder person mm. today is no longer the case when you were in the church no one was even telling you to stand up and give an old person so when when i'm at the bank and i see an old person a pregnant basically a person in need because i believe an elder person may be tired or something like that so a uh, respect was something which was centered in our culture mm. and which i'm seeing is really disappearing um very much um glory do you have any thoughts on this uh, question sure um first of all i would like to add on what silvi said about labia elongation she said it's done by women of course it's done by women but we've seen or heard stories of men who have divorced their women because they did not elongate their labia that's actually what they tell young kids when they're pulling for them they're like your man will cheat on you or he will not marry you or it, it's bizarre it's the culture and they they ignore the fact of first of all consent maybe i'll be a nun maybe i don't want to have sex maybe i don't want to pull my labia and then when someone grows up because a big number of women actually when they grow up they're not comfortable with how they are and these things are not reversible they're not comfortable with their bodies they don't want to explain to their foreign husbands what that is <laughs> because you're not going to sit someone down and be like ah oh, so when i was 7 my auntie okay you understand that some women will find that comfortable talking about but others won't so you're just not loving yourself just because your aunties or society decided for you and just like Sylvie said it's actually very shocking that women do it for men and some men don't actually even like it so why are we involving young children because this is still happening in rural and urban areas there's a woman who has a shop in Sheik and while i was interviewing her for my article on labia elongation she told me that some men bring their wives to her. So this is not even a matter of choice. This is coercion because it may not be physical, you may not be beating me, but emotionally I feel like if I don't do this, something terrible is going to happen to me. And this is something that we need people to start talking about as much as we want women to fully enjoy their bodily autonomy when they're adults. Let's not leave the kids out. If you want the labia, pull them. Honestly, that's your 
your business. But for a young kid, let's not sexualize them. And another thing she talked about and paid care work. There's a famous saying in Kenya Rwanda that when you go to a house and it's clean, just know there's a woman there, right? Why? Because cleaning is a woman's job. When you go to a house and you find it dirty, just know there's a man living there. Why? Because men can't clean. So these things are very hard to separate from traditions and beliefs and the culture itself. It sounds so simple to clean a house, but actually it is not because working moms are finding it hard to balance work at the office and work at home. Like she said, in social functions or in offices, housework is real. Uh, it's called office housework, where we're having an interview and a woman is the one who is actually rushing to get water for the guests, even when that is not her job. This is potential poor performance because she's spending more time than her male counterparts taking care of her workmates, of guests who are not even hers, things like that, which are not even paid for. So you've given me literally two traditional she, practices. And the, and the three we discussed about it, Dory. Dory is a harmful practice. Mm. That's mm. what I think. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you said what feminists agree with. Yes, in terms of our traditional cultural values yeah, or so practices. I, I will not say what feminists agree with. I'll just say what I think. I as would, a feminist. Yeah, as okay. a feminist, I would agree to. First of all, it is Guhemba. When a woman has given birth and people bring everything to support her, they bring food, they bring soap. And I like the way it has turned it w in the modern edge. You don't even need to visit her. If you don't have time, you can send her money on her mobile money. Mm. You can uh, take diapers. You can take rice, milk. Uh, that is a very good practice. That's what I think. But also some parts of it back in the day or maybe maybe present in the day are still not good because sometimes if the money is for the child, it is given to the man because the man is the head of the family and he controls the finances. So guhemba is a good practice, but when done correctly, when it's actually guhemba, umubjei, wabjai, right? And then um, umuganda is a good practice. I, apparently it was something that a community did for a family which could not maybe uh, cultivate for a certain season because of trouble they, they were facing. And sometimes these were widows who don't have their husbands to do that, or women who had just given birth, things like that. Another one is Gutabarana. So I understand that this may not be explicitly about gender, but this is something that positively affects women such as Gutabara, if you're losing your husband, people will come and pay school fees for your children, uh, support you in all the ways. So I think we have a number of good practices. So when we're talking about the harmful ones, don't think we are all for the culture is bad. No, we love our culture, but we think some practices are harmful. And as culture is dynamic, we don't need to stick to them because they are harmful. Thank you so much. So last week, controversially, European embassies based in Rwanda raised rainbow flags to celebrate the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the local reactions to the flag raising as well as the argument that I've heard stating that classical feminism is being pushed to the side because of the LGBT movement. So I will start maybe with Glory. Do you think there's any truth to this argument? I think my thought is very small. I think feminism should be intersectional and should always also include trans people. So that's my thought. Sylvie? Maybe starting from what she has said, feminism is about all gender having equal rights and opportunities. I wouldn't say that the feminist movement is really being pushed because core to feminism is really inclusivity and intersectionality. As she said, we are aiming really at making sure that people's choices are centered and are respected. It, when human rights are respected, uh, for me as a feminist, I really feel that I'm not pushed away way, actually, uh, what we have been advocated for about diversity is being respected. I would say I was generally happy to see that the Rwandan community is tolerant 
and accepting that we have the LGBTQ community around us and within our community. Yes, there was really a um, certain level of toxicity, especially from Christian, uh, which really uh, shocked me because personally, as a Christian, I believe in respect, tolerance, and um, really accepting anyone the way they are uh, because I'm not God to judge them. I just feel that Christian, we should really be an example of tolerance. And I would say I, I didn't do a survey to see who was for that or not, but I think in terms of the advancement, how these things were being discussed about in the past is really different. Rwandan are really understanding that uh, we have those people with us and they have the right to live their life and the fact is that in Rwanda they, they work freely. I do understand that we lack specific laws to protect them as them but if you see again in our constitution they are really talking about the rights um, of every every Rwandan citizen. So centering uh, when I want to advocate for an issue I start from our constitution. I do understand that they are facing so many challenges and as the society evolves because laws and policies come for a specific needs. I'm really thinking that when the government will see um, it's timely, they will put specific laws. Like we know that, for example, children are fragile. They needed to have the specific laws protecting them. I think it's an issue of also culture because our culture has defined who is a man, who is a woman. Uh, and trying today to disrupt that is really hard. Like uh, the way our culture, they weren't uh, tolerating to see a talkative woman like me, a woman who voice, uh, who speak about what she think about. And today they're accepting us. So for me, I'm really very optimistic that um, the Rwandan society will move toward integrating or accepting in the, the LGBT community. I'll send this question over to Glory because she gave me an answer but I want to dig a bit further. The reason why I brought up this this conversation, especially in terms of feminism, is because right now we're not having that discussion LGBT, how it's dealing with feminism. I, I'm seeing that conversation in the West where you know, feminism has pushed quite far, but so has the LGBT inclusive movement. And it's going so far as to have trans women in female sports. And they're now talking about bathrooms and, and you know, a trans, a trans woman can go to a woman's bathroom or even it has gone as far as to have trans women in female spaces like women's prisons. So I was just kind of wondering, some feminists, not all of them, obviously, are saying that, you know, there are some spaces that should be for women. And I was just kind of wondering, maybe it's not a conversation for us yet, but then as feminists, as local feminists, do we ever see that becoming an issue? Glory. Thank you, Sunny. Can I first yeah, talk sure. about how they, I, I, I hope it went? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was happy to see that um, European embassies in Kigali actually marked the day because it is 12 years after Rwanda signed a UN joint statement ending acts of violence and related human rights violations based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So while these, these celebrations were not marked by the government of Rwanda, but in Rwanda, it's actually a positive step towards uh, being more inclusive and finally ending the stigma that the LGBT community in Rwanda has been living in for, I think, since we've had them, which mm -hmm. is since we've all existed. So I've seen a few homophobic and transphobic ideas. Uh, there was a woman who compared the raising of the flag uh, at the Belgian embassy as when Rwandans were given ethnic uh, identity cards. So if someone can compare someone fighting for their rights with something that culminated into the genocide, then I think we have so much more work to do. And like Sylvie said, these are mostly religious-based people who are putting forth their ideas. If our parents uh, were gay, we wouldn't have been born. But uh, I think more awareness should be done on such topics because as much as the Rwandan constitution says that uh, we're all born equal before the law, it also uh, prohibits 
discrimination based on any kind. And I think these words being voiced out, talking about people who are also Rwandans, who are Rwandans just like everyone else is Rwandan. I think if nothing is done, then this toxicity and homophobic ideas being voiced just blatantly will be very dangerous. And it, it has also been dangerous. I mean, it's already dangerous because if some people are not fully expressing themselves like the rest of the population, then that's a big problem. Now on to your question of trans women and women. And women's only spaces or women's only institutions, whether it's schools or sports or bathrooms or prisons. I think we all have unique challenges. Men, women, trans women, trans men, intersex people, we all have unique challenges. And I think being more inclusive does not hurt anything. If trans women are taken to women prisons, then I think it should instead be female and male based on sex, gender, and maybe being more inclusive because I've seen several companies have male and female bathrooms, but they also have trans or gender neutral bathrooms. Like that doesn't hurt, honestly. It doesn't hurt to be a little bit more inclusive. Now having having trans women in women spaces, I think it can only be problematic if the practicability of it is not really serving the purpose of, of that space. So you say like prison and I'm suggesting that we can instead base on sex than gender because I've seen news stories of trans women raping women in prison, for example, or trans women winning women marathon like several times, which I think, well, we can see how that develops in Rwanda, but, but for now, I don't think we can worry about it. It's not our problem at the moment? Yeah, I don't think we can worry about that at the moment because what we should worry about at the moment about the LGBT community and the feminist movement is actually making the LGBT community recognized and hard in Rwanda and treated like like everyone else is treated and not living in fear or in shame or being banished from their families, things like that. And uh, this one goes to Sylvia. Do you think that the feminist movement in Rwanda is doing all that it can to actually make it even as inclusive as, pos as possible? I would say first people are really biased about feminists and there is no official feminist movement in Rwanda when I mean movement it's because movement are registered for example but there are feminists in certain organizations who are really trying hard to push inclusivity and um, uh, human rights in the organization they were like personally I've been working for the government for um, 17 years and everything I did I really intentionally um, tried to make sure that different people are benefiting from it, like um, digital inclusion, because that was my my expertise and my work was centered really around that. So I could check and say, this policy we are bringing, for example, in education, how inclusive is it? How um, students with disabilities are going to use those machines? So I personally try to do that. And I know different feminists and feminist ally doing that word the year. So as I said at the beginning, really feminism is is about respecting um, diversity, is about respecting uh, people's experiences and identity, is about really um, centering choice. Uh, for me, when I see, first I know that um, even us, among us women, we have um, queer women who are going through a lot, um, who are being first discriminated by us ourselves, women. Uh, so their experiences, It's uh, at one point I told you about our privileges. So I have so many privileges privileges, for example, than a queer woman because first she's labeled this certain way, second she's not going to go in the bathroom where she feels she wants to go maybe. So there, there are different layers of inequalities, of discrimination and injustice she goes through. Um, I'm sure when she goes to ask service, she has to get service like me, like in the government, um, any information she's normally supposed to have it uh, because our laws is really centered to inclusivity. 
she, but she may be discriminated by an individual person, not an institution policy discriminating that. So I, many times you see themselves saying, we really want laws protecting us. When they are requesting for laws protecting them, it's to make sure that even an individual don't use that loophole and say, now I'm discriminating you. Specifically, when it comes to their experiences, I remember one a friend of mine, he was a doctor, and he told me how he went in the human rights movement because he saw how uh, lesbian women were being treated. For example, when they had, uh, and even uh, gay men, because when they were coming uh, to see a doctor with different needs, when you are, for example, a, a man and they see you, maybe you need a certain medication because you had issues, they will not be really happy or feeling free, the doctors or the nurses, to treat you by then, I think 15 years ago. But today, um, when I'm trying to ask my friend who are in that community, of course, people were discriminating them. They are not opening up about that. They may delay or run away with you, but they know that if they discriminate you, they may have issues. Uh, so I really think that it's an urgent issue. We may say that that is not a problem in our community. The same way that when we talk about issues, they say, but we have gender equality policies. All women are respected, but some women you will see when they are pregnant, their contracts are, are ended, or especially in the private sector. You may say that people are benefiting from the same laws with others, but because they have their specificity, because we talked about different people's experiences, identity, they may be discriminated in an unseen way. Those small discriminations, which it's only you who is being affected, who will feel them, but officially it's not written there that if you are from this gender, you are not accepted seeing this. My question to people is this. We know without hiding that we have friends or family or neighbors who either gay or queer or identified in, with a certain gender. We know very much they are there. So do we want them to remain in silence, suffer from that? When they are sick, they will not come out. Is it what we want as a society? Because at the end of the day, we are living with them in a society. If we are living them in the society, why we don't want them to, to feel free? to live a life uh, they want. By saying that, I know it's controversial. People are telling me, Sylvie, yes, we are going to tolerate them. And I don't like that word tolerating because even me, my friend tolerates me because sometimes I'm noisy, but uh, I just want everyone to be really sincere with themselves. If those people are in our society, they are not here today. They have been always there. Why not making sure that we hear their needs, we hear their struggles of every day. We try even to frame policies or program uh, basing on their needs because for example we are talking about teen pregnancy we are accepting it as a challenge in our society but no one wants to accept that this community is facing their own challenges when you meet parents i have tried to talk to parents who have children in that community they are really struggling a lot first the stigma everyone understanding that you have this child second that child who's hiding them so because as a mother as a father you want your child to be happy I'm not saying you are promoting homosexuality because like no one is promoting motherhood or not promoting it because people, if they want to be mothers, they are becoming mother. I'm trying to, to bring simple examples which will make everyone understand if we have these people in our community, what is best for us is to silence them. They live their own life, their own fears, or it is to come on the table with them and we say, we know you are there. How are you feeling? What are you missing? How do you think we should really do programming of, of the things you need? So I'm not seeing that frank conversation. I know there are NGOs working around that, trying to give them spaces. And feminists, I know my friend feminists who are really close to them, who talk to them every day. When you talk to them, you see that really the worry is that those people may even end up, because people are calling them that they have mental issues because they are into homosexuality. No, they may have actually um, mental issues because our society, which is not giving them the right spaces, which want them to be hidden we may maybe mitigate that by giving them their spaces and understanding what is going on. The fear as a mother, as a parent, I'm sharing the fear with others. They are saying if we bring them out, 
they are going kind of, I'm sorry to use that word, contaminate other children. Mm. That word has been used even on Twitter spaces. Th there are challenges we have to, to sit and accept that they are there. Because I don't think someone who does not have uh, that sexual orientation will go there just because they have been intoxicated. It's just because maybe in our family, we don't want to have that open conversation. Then maybe my child may arrive at school and get so much information in a little time where they don't have enough time to digest this and to form their identities. So for me, I'll just try to tell parents uh, Sunny, when I was in the youth council, we had challenges putting condom in schools. Mm. The fear was that if you put condoms where young people are, you are sending them to actually go and have sex. So to actually go and have sex. It's more or less the same fear of parents, educators, guardians, when you are talking about homosexuality. For me personally, they are challenging myself and say, Sylvie, if we leave this thing open, we talk about it, it's kind of intoxicating. But the fact is that even when, when you, you don't talk about sex in schools, you find the girls pregnant if they are pregnant pregnant, it means there was some sexual relationships which happened. So um, there's one thing in our culture, n um, replacing something you fear about by silence. And that is not okay. We need to talk about even subjects which are really complicated as a family. So how to introduce them? I think it's the right time for policymakers to guide us as parents, mm -hmm. as um, educators to tell us how do you start to talk about sexuality at which age and what do you say specifically at a certain age so that kids grow up into um, young adults who are enough empowered who have different capabilities to grasp all those things and to form what they want to become I in life uh, like i want to keep it within that frame People are, we're trying to constantly learn, right? And, and figure out, okay, how do we handle these things? Yeah. But then many Rwandans are watching what is happening in the West with both confusion and fear, especially where gender is being redefined. You know, before it, we understood that it was m men and women. And that was something that, you know, it was already hard enough for us to, to give women equality uh, as a society. And now, instead of just hearing men and women, we are now learning that there are more than two genders. In fact, some say that there are up to six genders. And so instead of, you know, pronouns like, you know, we're now starting to hear like, you know, instead of pronouns like she and him, now we're hearing they and them. And I want to ask myself, and I, I think I want to ask you, do you think that Rwandan culture and who we are, and, and even maybe even Rwandan law, if, if we, we can go even further than that, can it be compatible with all these changing definitions of gender and what gender is? Maybe, Glory, you want to take that question first? People have to understand that culture is dynamic, right? Women couldn't milk cows. Women couldn't eat goat. Women couldn't eat chicken chicken as well, right? Mm. Why? Because uh, it was a taboo. Something bad could have happened. But now they eat it, right? I, I bet some of us have chicken or pochette as our favorite dishes. I think the culture and the Rwandan law are going to be more inclusive about this because of one reason. Because these people are Rwandans. And if the constitution says that we are all born equal, and remain equal before the law, then that makes them automatically on the same level as us. We've had the government have education policies, the gender policy, agriculture policy. They can also have the sexual and gender minority policy to protect mm -hmm. them. I can give you an example of how bad uh, the situation is, is actually, and maybe you'll get a glimpse. So in 2021, and this is something that was reported by several media houses in Rwanda, a coach of a local football team was fired. And the reason he was fired in an open letter was because he was accused of being gay. Now, in the letter, they say you're, you're being uh, uh, temporarily suspended because of a problem you're accused of that doesn't dignify the team and yourself. And they go on and say that why they investigate the problem of homosexuality <laughs> that he's accused of, uh, they, they're te uh, basically suspending him. It's already regarded as a problem 
and they're investigating. How do you investigate someone on how they're having sex, honestly? Which but is I a guess here's matter. my question, though. Here we're not even <coughs> talking about that, <coughs> per se. Uh, bless you. Um, we're now, I'm talking about the issues around gender, not uh, whether you're gay or not, but now we're having those new genders. Because when you also look at the, our constitution, it talks about women and men. There's nothing in between there. And yet, on the other side, we're seeing that there are new ideas of the gender constructs versus sexual constructs, right, where you have male and female. That one, but now you have these different genders. So that's why I was asking about the idea of gender. In our culture, I think, when we even talk about our cultural practices, right, there were female and male. There was what men were supposed to do, what women were supposed to do. And so I'm just kind of trying to like understand and, and from your, from a feminist viewpoint with these new ideas of gender, how can Rwanda be compatible with these new ideas? In law, do we need to change the constitution? Maybe we need to do that. Frankly speaking, I'm not seeing our culture today mm. accepting it because initially you asked um, from the culture perspective and from the legal perspective. perspective. Um, culturally, I'm really finding it hard for our culture to, to agree on, on that point. But one thing I tell people about is that Rwanda is really a progressive country. Uh, when I arrived in this country two decades ago, <laughs> there was no GBV law, for example. I remember being part of the first um, task force drafting it. Um, when I arrived here, we didn't have the girls' education policy. We didn't have basically the disability policy, elderly policy, those things. So they are coming with time. And I'm seeing <laughs> the legal part of it really being proactive in few years to come and of course by being proactive is to to repeal some laws <laughs> and try to amend some because our constitution really is centered around diversity is centered around inclusivity there are so many other words which may contradict but uh, if you try to unpack the word inclusivity itself it means Basically, every Rwandan with their identities in their diverse experiences have to feel included, part of that. So I'm really optimistic and, and I'm seeing Rwanda really protecting specifically the right of every Rwandan. I'm not dreaming, but I'm seeing it coming. The disconnect now between our laws and culture is where our policy makers should come and see how now to bring Rwandan on this new path where they have to understand because those people are part of us basically as I said so we need to accept to have hot and hard talks in families and how to do that we are citizens and we are watching our leaders basically uh, from the culture ministry from the gender and family ministry from the education ministry to help us unpack this for people to understand to be more inclusive to accept what I wouldn't say um, the new Terms. Maybe in terms of wording, lexical things, they may be new, but the people were part of us. Because if you see the history of homosexuality in our culture, it's not really a Western thing as we are thinking. It has been part of us. I remember when I was young with really not much knowledge around this, uh, there were people that were calling tomboys, tom girls. Mm. And later in life, you found that they were lesbian. And at that time, we were still very young really to understand that. So if those people were there and are still there, they need an environment which is protective. And the one thing which is dear to this government is really the people. Everything is centered about the people, the citizen. Um, for me, I'm really optimistic that very soon the government will have to adjust in protecting them specifically because anyone meets them on the road can talk to them the way they want. And because there is no law protecting them, there is a loophole. Something need to fix because you are calling them yes citizen like me you are telling saying that they are going to be protected by the laws which protect Rwandan but in reality they are facing challenges which are different from mine which are different from someone else who's straight so it means 
we need to pay attention on that. But in general, if you see the tolerance of Rwandans uh, towards the LGBTQ community, comparing to our region, I feel bad when I want to compare issues of human rights. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's like to say um, here it's at 50 percent, another place. But uh, seriously, I have traveled in the region around. Um, I think on a certain scale, you will say uh, the LGBT community is safe than in other surrounding countries where they are really very toxic. They they throw stones on them. Uh, I would say maybe in Congo where I know what happens every day. In Uganda, we have seen what's happening. In Kenya, in, in a known place, they can be beaten. They can be, you know, anyone can just play. But at least here, you, when you have an issue, you have the police to call, you have other agencies. And anyone who will do that, will do that in a hidden place, not really in a street and come and attack you can do that like a thieves you know when a thieves want to take something from you we'll make sure no one is seeing me so um and that is giving me hope of seeing rwanda really a progressive country which will will be protecting those specific because feminism really is about also understanding people's choice but also minding about thinking about our <laughs> privileges so i my activism is really centered on Inclusion and diversity, but by using my privilege, me, um, I know that I have privilege than a queer woman. So how am I using my voice to protect her or to empower her? Um, and other people like children also have been part of my activism. I just think every Rwandan should be conscient about what is happening. But as a parent, I always come about that. Who is teaching us how to educate those kids in our family? Because I grew up in a family which wasn't discussing about homosexuality. Now I'm raising my kids in a society where cartoons are coming, uh, showing girls kissing each other. And young people, people as young as seven, eight, uh, are you going to go running and switch off the TV immediately? You are creating another form of curiosity to your kid. Why did mommy do this? What? Next time the tendency will be to go to see that. So we are leaving questions which are not answered. So who is empowering me? I remember, I'm very sorry to, to mix those two topics. I bought a friend's book. It was Dimitri book. I was there and I bring it home. I left it uh, to the table because my kids love reading because me, I don't like reading. So I didn't grow up reading. So I'm making sure that my kids are reading. And I think in that night and another night, she had read it. And she said, mommy, do so she started narrating me Dimitri's story, which is a very hard story for me to tell it to my daughter of eight years. I had to run to call friend. How how do I unpack this topic? Do I call someone in education? How do you teach this? Concept? Because it was my first time my daughter really relating to that. It was hard for me and I was honest in my vulnerability, understanding that I cannot explain this topic. Mm. By the way, I haven't even got someone to help me unpack it. So I'm not putting a parallelism between two, but we need to understand the trending issues as parents, how hard they are to us and now how are we unpacking them? Those kids of today are not like us. They are kids who are now exposed on this, we call it a competence-based curriculum, where they are putting a topic and kids are discussing. So it's not at home where you are going to leave hanging questions. So for me, I'm advocating for my fellow parents. We want to be empowered, and I think that is the role of the Ministry of Family. They have the responsibility, children and other, and education. If I'm not empowered as a parent to tackle homosexuality to unpack it I will leave an answered question to my children and my children will go to look for peers who will say things maybe which are not appropriate which are not age appropriate so for me actually the challenge is not uh, maybe what people may think this challenge is how am I going to raise my kids in this society because I'm not going to hide them what am I going to tell them who should I even ask what I should say I, I may be putting too much blame on policymakers, on curriculum developers, but I feel I'm not empowered to raise my kid in this generation, which has realities which I need to unpack. I think as a young mother and as the youngest here, I'll give Glory the last word on uh, the podcast today. Do you want to add anything to what Sylvia said? Sure, but unlike her, I still think the culture will embrace the different gender expressions. And I say this because of the recently launched Comprehensive Sexuality Education 
which had a Kinyaranda version with Kinyaranda terms that explained everything. So if someone is already willing to have local words describing something so uh, considered foreign in the society, that person is already making people uh, aware, is already putting that into our, our context. But I also remember uh, how people, even uh, government ministers, reacted to that. So on one side, they, they did have this toolkit, but I think on the other side, there was that negative reaction to, to that book. I think what happened was that they probably didn't agree with the book being taught in schools, but the book was launched and when the, the government statement was released, they said they merely did not endorse the book, but they did not withdraw the book, which had already had 1,000 copies distributed and 7,000 peer educators trained mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, so I, I still think there is hope for women and for the queer community, for the Rwandan queer community, because uh, just like Sylvie said, our constitutions and our laws are, are for the people. It's just a matter of taking one step at a time, just like it has happened with women who couldn't own land in 1994 and before, but now they own land. No one is saying... Uh, uh, you can't have land because you're a woman. Now we have the law which um, women have, don't have to ask hus uh, their husband's permission to go to work. Uh, the banks do not require your husband's permission to open a bank account. And these are steps that we took over time. And I think um, while we wish that the government takes a position immediately on the LGBTQ, it is not possible because who is going to vote for that? Because as much as we advocate for this, most of the people in the parliament, most of the people who should be implementing that probably still hold the same views like everyone else in society. So I think for now, uh, we need to, just like Sylvie said, as much as we want to unpack this to our children, but also adults need to be taught about this. They need to understand, even us who still advocate for their rights, there are things we don't know. We, there are things we, we cannot explain. We all need to be informed, to learn, to unlearn different things. And I think there is positive, positive, positive promises right ahead, and not even uh, in the far future, in the near future. Glory. Sylvie, thank you so much for joining me today. And I learned so much. And and I feel like everyone has learned something about inclusivity and the plight and challenges of being a woman and uh, being queer as well. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Before we leave, would you like to partner with The Long Form? Send an email to sales at newtimesronda.com and ask for our rates. If you enjoy this show, Subscribe to The Long Form with Sunny Nyombia on your favorite podcast service. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music, as well as the New Times website. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>